Hey friends, welcome to History Savvy. Today, we're gonna to be continuing on with Oversimplified's history of the American Civil War. This is part two for them. However, in my reaction series, this is video three. So as always, if you're interested in watching just their plain video, I'll put a link down in the description. Also link to my previous reaction videos if you're interested in those. Now, I think uh, Oversimplified's done a, a really good job of providing a survey history of the American Civil War. I've enjoyed it so far, and I'm looking forward to this one, and I hope I can give you one or two more tidbits that you might not have known. And so let's get into it. As the Union struggle to take control in the East continued, elsewhere, the war raged on. The Confederates attempted an invasion of Kentucky, hoping the state as a whole would join them, but they were pushed back. The Indian Territory saw Native American tribes ally with one side or the other in the hopes of securing rights after the war. Along the Mississippi, General Ulysses S. Grant remained one of the few Union generals scoring major victories. With his best pal, General Sherman, by his side, Grant led his armies down the Mississippi to the Confederate stronghold of Vicksburg. Both sides knew that if Vicksburg fell, the Confederacy would be split in two, and the Confederates prepared for an intense defense of the city. But back in the East, Lincoln's... Vicksburg is an important um, battle in the history of the Civil War, and I hope they talk about it more. But I also want to talk about theaters of war. Because, well, like World War II, we talk about the European theater and the Pacific theater. Well, the American Civil War also had different theaters. So we have the Eastern Theater. I just want to go back and have a look at the broader map here. Elsewhere, the war raged on. There we go. The so here we have, unsurprisingly, the Eastern Theater. And here we have the Western Theater. And then everything west of the Mississippi here was called the Trans-Mississippi Theater. Now, if you're interested in Civil War history and you're interested in, in being up to date on, on professional uh, historians' work on the Civil War, then the Trans-Mississippi Theater is where a lot, excuse me, of recent work is being done. It's some interesting work. Um, there was a book that I read. It focused on uh, Trans-Mississippi Theater, Native American tribes, uh, little battles and skirmishes that went out there. I cannot remember the name of it right now, but I remember enjoying it, so I'll link to it down in the description as well. But... Uh, the, the theaters were important. Now, today, as then, the Eastern Theater received the most attention. And it was the theater that served as a kind of barometer for public morale in both the North and the South. If you were the, the important people, so to speak, important generals were involved heavily in the theater. And this kind of bothered Lincoln because Grant saw successes in, in the Western theater, and he thought that should count for more than it did in the minds of the public. And so when morale went down as a result of the loss of a loss in the East, the public ignored a victory in the West, that annoyed Lincoln. So he, he wished people had a, a broader understanding, a broader picture of what was going on in the wider war. Let's carry on here. Both sides knew that if Vicksburg fell, the Confederacy would be split in two, and the Confederates prepared for an intense defense of the city. But back in the East, Lincoln still wanted somebody to march south and take Richmond. Having given General McClellan the boot, he needed a new man in charge. All right, Mr. President, option one is General Hooker. Bit of a nutcase, but a good general. Option two, his qualifications are his name is Burnside and he has freaking dope ass sideburns. <laughs> Say no more. So General Burnside was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac and sent south. Lincoln hoped he finally had a general who could succeed. Burnside met General Lee at the city of Fredericksburg, where he intended to rapidly cross the river and take the city. But the Union War Department was too slow in delivering the pontoon bridges and the two sides were forced to camp across from each other, close enough to speak. Hey Yankee, ready to get your butt kicked? Yeah right, Rebel. God is on our side. No way, God's on our side. Oh, you think so? Well, why don't we ask him? Hey God, whose side are you on? <laughs> Ow. Dude, uncool. With over 100... So I think it's also the Battle of Fredericksburg where there are stories of kind of singing competitions uh, that arose between the Confederates and the Union. Now there's a small but I think growing literature on music in the combating armies during the war and a lot of these soldiers had 
they shared similar songs. And so singing was a big part of being a soldier. It was a way to unify a group and they sang, basically, is what I'm saying. And I think it is Fredericksburg um, that they had kind of a singing battle one night. Not 100% sure on that, but I do remember reading a piece on a singing battle. 100,000 men, the Union Army finally launched their massive attack on the 11th of December. But by now, the Confederates had amassed their forces. During the battle, wave after wave of brave Union men marched headlong into a brutal Confederate onslaught. Even the Confederates couldn't believe what they were seeing. And in one moment of camaraderie, a Confederate sergeant, unable to take it, reportedly came out into the field to tend to the Union wounded. Seeing this, the Union troops held their fire. Still, Burnside and his forces were soundly defeated. Now. There is some historical debate as to whether or not that story of a Confederate soldier leaving his lines to, to tend to Union wounded is true or not. Um, and I'll talk about that more here in a minute. But what happened with the broader battle is Burnside attempted to flank Lee. Uh, that flanking attempt was stopped by Stonewall Jackson. And then after that, Burnside was really unimaginative in his persecution of the battle. He just sent Union soldiers into, uh, into strong Confederate lines in frontal assaults like what we just saw there, and it just didn't work. Um, so that really helped spell the end of Burnside as the commander of the Potomac Army. Now going back to the, the Confederate who left his lines to treat the Union wounded, um, the story goes that he, one night after hearing the Confederate, or sorry, after hearing the Union soldiers moaning and, and crying out for water or help in, in the battlefield, he decided to go to his commanding officer and ask for permission to go out and, and give them some. Uh, the commanding officer thought that's crazy, but eventually agreed to let him go. This guy went and got canteens from his comrades, then went out and started treating and wounded. And he did this for apparently about 90 minutes. And this was in full view of both the Confederate and the Union armies, neither of whom fired a shot. Now, this story didn't come out until early 1880s, about 20 years after it was supposed to have happened. And it first came out as a result of a newspaper publication by the commanding officer of this man who named him. Um, but when we go back to the actual event and the records that were generated um, after the battle, the after-action reports, the commendations, the significant events, we see no mention of this man at all. Um, there are some records of Union soldiers saying, yes, I was given some help, some water uh, from Confederates, but that's, that's really about it. Now, if this was so significant, um, in the minds of people, you'd have thought somebody, thousands of witnesses, would have actually written this down, and nobody did. He, the commanding officer himself didn't mention it um, at the time, and he also failed to mention it in later publications. So there's real doubt as to whether or not this event happened. And in my mind, it's more a story about um, post-Civil War reconstruction healing, trying to heal these wounds um, at, that that uh, were created um, before the war and during the war, bring the nation together once again to show that um, there's humanity on both sides and that there's a brotherhood. So it's a nice story. There's monuments to it, and a lot of people don't really question it. But I think there's there's really good reason to question whether or not this happened at Fredericksburg and forced to retreat. Lincoln's popularity and northern morale continued to plummet, especially as the winter heading into 1863 was bad. The winter camps were rife with disease. The food was less than appealing. On both sides, Gross. men began to leave. Hey, where do you think you're going? I'm deserting. What? Don't you love your country? Yes, I do. And I'm trying to get back to it as quick as I can. Lincoln, ever the kind and so desertion and straggling were big problems for armies in the Civil War. And it was certainly a big problem among the Confederates who didn't have the same access to supplies that the soldiers did. Now, a big factor 
that uh, that created disease in camps was the fact that latrines were stupidly located next to water sources, sometimes in streams with the idea that the stream would carry the waste away. Uh, latrines that were located not exactly next to streams or in streams um, were, were dug, and then after a week, they'd throw some fresh dirt on the feces, thinking that would be enough, and it wasn't. So diarrhea was an enormous problem in, in both armies, but especially the Confederate Army. This also led to straggling, where men were not in the health required to carry out really long marches. There was a big amount of suffering. Uh, desertion was also a problem, as people became disenchanted with causes. Um, there were men in the Confederate Army who did not like the idea of invading Pennsylvania and other northern territories, as they saw their war as a defensive war. They were defending their homelands, so attacking was not something that they had exactly signed up for. Of course, that wasn't a big enough problem to prevent Lee and his northern invading Pennsylvania, but it was an attitude that existed. The caring man he was spent much of his time pardoning deserters' death sentences. Oh my, here's a 17-year-old boy sentenced to be hanged. Well, I'd better suspend his sentence, or he'll be suspended tomorrow. Oh. <sighs> what? To try to keep the numbers up, both sides had introduced conscription. Oh, there was controversy in the North, however, since rich men could simply pay to have someone else fight on their behalf. Riots broke out in New York City with enraged mobs furious at the idea of going to fight for slaves, an idea that many of them simply did not support. However, after... So, I think that that's good. That speaks to the fact that uh, though people might have been approving of emancipation, they still held uh, racial prejudice against black people. Now, with conscription, um, it's more appropriately called drafts, that came into effect for both sides in the 1803. Now, on the Confederate side, the Confederates said, um, we need everybody between the 1835 to be uh, to join the army, and if you're already in the army, we're extending your service. There were exceptions. If you were a plantation owner who held 20 slaves, you were exempt from service. If you were rich enough, you could buy a substitute, or you could just pay basically a fine to get out of your service responsibility. And that was problematic for a lot of Confederates. Uh, these Confederates saw this conscription law, this draft law, as as an affront to their individual rights, their individual autonomy, ability to decide if they're going to fight or not. They also saw it as an affront to states' rights. Why is the federal government uh, forcing down a law on all states, regardless of whether these states want, want it or not? Aren't we fighting for states' rights here? So uh, that was ironically a problem and, and some delicious cognitive dissonance for Confederate soldiers. Now in the North, uh, things operated much the same. If you were between the ages of 20 and 45, you were eligible for the, for the draft. You could also buy a substitute or pay, excuse me, about a $300 fine to uh, get out of, of service. Now, $300 in 1863 is about $10,000 in 2023 money. So not terrible, but it's also not a, a small chunk of change. There were also plenty in the North who resisted the idea of a draft, and they dodged the draft by going to Canada. So I, I think that's a great parallel between what was happening in America 100 years later in the 1960s with the Vietnam War and what was going on in America in 1860 with the Civil War. At the end of the war, we're looking at uh, about 80% of eligible men uh, who fought in or, or at least mobilized the Confederate Army, and about 50% of eligible men served or mobilized in. So much pressure, the Union had finally begun allowing black men to enlist, and these men, knowing what they were fighting for, signed up. By the end of the war, nearly 200,000 troops, 10% of the Union Army, would be black. The valor and bravery they showed throughout, silencing critics. Okay, well that last... So, I think that makes it seem like a lot of the, the black men who were in uniform in the Union Army during the war were engaged in a combat role. 
which uh, that's that's not true. The majority of black men in the Union Army were in rear echelon positions, supportive roles, not active combat roles. So they main, built and maintained camps, railroads, roads, anything that the army needed to, to function effectively, a lot was, was relegated to black men in the army. There was also a differential treatment in the army, essentially systemized racism, where black men were paid $3 less than white men in the army, paid $10 a month, $13 a month for white men. White men also had the benefit of receiving a clothing stipend and didn't. Um, officers initially were typically white, though by the end of the war there were about 100 black officers in the army. Um, they did distinguish themselves, uh, like the 54th Massachusetts. Um, there was the Battle of the Crater towards the end of the war where, where black men fought valiantly in roles. Unfortunately, they were poorly led in that instance. So uh, also black men, I, I should speak to the masculinity thing. Masculinity was a big feature in men joining the army during the Civil War. And it was also a feature in the minds of black men who saw this as a way to prove their masculinity, that they were not less of a man than white men, they were willing to take the same risks, do the same things um, as, as manly men. They were also participating in the fight for emancipation to rid the United States of slavery. So there were a compound set of, of motivations for black men in uniform that white men in uniform didn't necessarily have. Last guy was useless. Let's try this Hooker fellow. General Joseph Hooker was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac, and once again, Lincoln ordered him to move south and take Richmond. Hooker. Now, Hooker was also known as Fightin' Joe. Fightin' Joe Hooker. Hooker met Lee at the Battle of Chancellorsville, where Hooker had over twice the men Lee did. Lee was forced to defy all military convention and split his smaller force into two. Lee had absolutely no chance of winning, and Lee won. It was his masterpiece. Lee did suffer one significant loss during the battle, though. As his right-hand man, Stonewall Jackson, was riding back to the Confederate lines at night, the nervous Confederate troops, unable to recognize him, opened fire. You boys done goofed up. Jackson died eight days later. As for Lincoln, he couldn't believe it. It was... Now, Chancellorsville was a huge victory for Lee, but it came at a terrible price. It was, it was a bloody battle and the Confederates lost a lot as casualties. It was a, su a success because Hooker was on the offensive, and Lee divided his army, uh, he was far weaker, and he went on the offensive, stopped Hooker's offensive, put Hooker on the defensive, and, and the retreat. Initially, Hooker tried to flank Lee. That was stopped by Stonewall Jackson. Regarding Stonewall Jackson's death, what happened there was was after the day's fighting, Jackson, along with A.P. Hill and some other uh, Confederate men, went out on horseback reconnaissance reconnaissance mission. It's dark on their way back. Um, a, a Confederate skirmisher is spooked and fires a shot. That encourages other Confederates to kind of wake up, focus on what's going on, and fire off a few shots themselves. Other Confederate skirmishers see men approaching their lines on horseback. They have no idea that this is Jackson and, and fellow Confederates. They assume that this is a Confederate cavalry uh, group coming to harass their lines. So they open fire. Balls rip into Jackson's group. Jackson himself is struck. The men who survive get off their horse and hug the ground. Jackson is struck in the hand. Uh, the ball breaks his thumb, other fingers, and in his hand. He's also struck in the arm and in the shoulder. Bones are shattered there. He's hit. He's still on his horse. His horse begins to run towards you lines. A.P. Hill stops his horse, pulls him down, and begins attending to his wounds. Now, by this time, there's far more gunfire going off. Union artillery opens up, starts shelling the area, assuming that the Confederates are launching an attack. So it's a, it's a really hot, active combat zone here. They eventually get Stonewall back to Confederate lines. He's seen by a surgeon. The surgeon says, we're going to have to take your arm. 
Stonewall Jackson says, you do what you have to do. They, they give him chloroform, knock him out, cut off his, his arm just. Upon hearing that Jackson had been wounded, Robert E. Lee says, Jackson may have lost his left arm, but I've lost my right arm. That's how important Jackson was to Lee. Jackson begins to recover. Things are looking really good for him. Uh, but he develops pneumonia. It's pneumonia that kills him. He goes in and out of consciousness. Sometimes he wakes up and he's, he thinks he's in battle. He's giving commands to his men. And then he goes back into unconsciousness. Sometimes he's, he's cogent, lucid. Other times he's not. But his final words were, let us cross over the river, rest in the shade of the trees. Jackson was a very religious man. For his death, he had a lot of philosophical, theological conversations with him. So that was, a, that was a real serious loss for the Confederate Army. When Lincoln hears about the loss at Chancellorsville, he says, my God, my God, what will the country say? Because of the impact of the morale, and we see that here on the screen, what will the country say? Concerned about that. So this really spells end of Hooker in his, in his role as a leader of the Potomac. Was yet another loss, and Northern support continued to waver. While the Union kept on struggling in the East, out West, unconditional surrender Grant was making moves as always. In an attempt to take Vicksburg on the Mississippi, he made a series of risky and bold movements. He sent a cavalry raid and feigned Sherman North to confuse the enemy. Then, aided by a fleet of ironclads on the river, he raced his army south to cross the Mississippi. Aware that the terrain to the north was restrictive, instead, he strategically moved northeast, hitting Vicksburg's supply line and defending his rear from Confederate armies in Jackson. Once he reached Vicksburg, the Confederate defense became hardened, and Grant was forced to settle in for a month-long siege, during which time he got rather bored. Despite So, Grant initially tried to take Vicksburg in December 1862. That failed. His supply lines were threatened, and he had to pull back to Tennessee. Between December 1862 and April 1863, he attempted a number of times to take Vicksburg, all of which failed, until he was able to run past the Confederate artillery along the Mississippi River. First, he set gunboats down the Mississippi, and a few days later, in the darkness, uh, uh, troop transports went down. That's how he was able to get his men across on the other bank of the Mississippi and pursue that, that battle plan. It was a very risky plan. A lot of his fellow officers said, this is not a good idea. This, we can find something better, but Grant pursued it. He took a big risk and he won big. Despite not taking the city, Lincoln loved it and encouraged Grant to hold firm. It would only be a matter of time before the Mississippi was in Union hands. Around this time, the people in the west of Virginia who had remained loyal to the Union throughout finally broke away to form their own state. They could have named it anything in the world, but the creative minds at the time came up with the ingenious West Virginia. Back in Washington, Lincoln won. So, on the note of West Virginia, what happened is when Virginia seceded in 1861, there were these, I think, 26 counties uh, here in the West that had a uh, few slaveholders and they had deeper economic ties to northern states. And so they said, we, we're not going to go along with the rest of Virginia here. They created an assembly, said we are the legitimate government of the state of Virginia. Uh, they redrew new border lines and eventually became the state of Virginia. Now, they didn't always go with the name of West Virginia. They went with the name of Kanawha, which is listed They could have here. named it anything. This was what they initially proposed the name of the state be. Um, but... As we all know, it became West Virginia, which is not totally weird. We have North and South Carolina, North and South Dakota. So yeah, naming things of, uh, by their cardinal direction is, is normal. In the world, but the creative minds at the time came up with the ingenious West Virginia. Back in also Washington, made a great Lincoln song. once again wanted a new general to take command. Oh my goodness, why do all these 19th century generals look so bust? Look, we got Sleepy Eyes Joe here. That's Princess Leia with a mustache. E.T. phoned the doctor. Fine, why don't we give Snapping Turtle McGee here a shot? So General Snapping Turtle McGee was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And it was a crucial time for the Union because once again, the Confederates decided to go on the attack. So far, they had done exceedingly well militarily. But as the war kept going, the Confederate economy was crumbling. 
Riots broke out in the streets of Richmond as the price of bread skyrocketed. Supplies were dwindling. Jefferson Davis. Now, I've actually recently done a video on uh, the bread riot in Richmond. Um, it's interesting how that was later framed as it was it was persecuted by a lot of women and young boys. Women, of course, were responsible for the household at the time. And it's not just the, the price of bread. There's more than economics at stake here. There's what's called the moral economy and what bread should be priced at, what, uh, what's, a, what's a fair and moral price for bread. And when that gets out of whack in the 19th century and even earlier, people tend to riot. So if you want to check that video out, I'm going to have a ton of links down in the description, but it will be there as well wanted to send men west to rescue Vicksburg, but General Lee knew the longer the war lasted, the worse their chances got. And he still hoped if he could just threaten DC, the already demoralized North would surrender. So in June 1863, with the momentum behind him, General Lee once again entered the North. The North wouldn't surrender. They would pursue peace negotiations with the Confederacy. Fighting his way through Maryland and into Pennsylvania, General Meade set out to meet him for what would be the most significant battle of the entire war. If the Confederates won, D.C. could fall. If the Union won, it would be a turning point as the Confederates would run out of steam and the small town that was to get caught up in the crossfire of the largest battle. June 1st, units from each army encountered one another and skirmished through the town itself. The townspeople were forced to take refuge, except for one man who reportedly ran outside for a strange reason. Joseph, what are you doing? I'm not going to let them take my beans. How many times do I have to tell you they're not here for your beans? By the second day. Oh. <laughs> that, that is funny. Um, but there was a legitimate concern that they would take his beans because the armies had no problem foraging local communities to serve their needs. And this man was, he was already hungry and he wanted to preserve his beans for his own, his own use. He didn't want either army coming in and taking those beans from him. So it, it seems funny on the surface, like why would you bother with beans in the midst of a battle? But it's food. It's, it's an essential part of life. He didn't want that being robbed from him. So he went out, risked his life uh, to essentially save his life. Over 100,000 men stretched for miles across the battlefield. Lee took the initiative, deciding to hit the enemy's flanks, and he came very close to breaking through the Union's disorganized left. But Union Colonel Joshua Chamberlain ordered a desperate bayonet charge, smashing into the Confederates and forcing them back. The Union forces held across the line. On the final day, Lee believed the Union Army had fortified its flanks, so he decided to finish them off with one massive central assault. The Confederates rushed at the Union lines during General Pickett's charge, and this time, it was the Union's turn to unleash hell. Meade had correctly guessed Lee's strategy, and the Confederates were decimated, forced to turn and flee. A devastated General Lee called out to his fleeing and wounded men, telling them it was his fault. And after holding for a counterattack that never came, he ordered a retreat back into Virginia. The North had just... Now, after the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln and a lot of the people in the North wanted me to pursue Lee back. They were on the retreat, pursue them. So it's a constant theme for Union generals in the war, not pursuing Lee and Confederate armies when they had the opportunity. So that was a big point of frustration for Lincoln and a lot of people in the North. Meade was, I think, the fourth general of the Army of the Potomac, like seven months or so. So they're just cycling through generals. And so there's there's public frustration. Okay, yeah, we won the battle, but he didn't pursue an opportunity when he had the chance. Lee, it was a significant defeat for Lee, um, but it, it didn't damage his reputation in the South, although it was a costly uh, loss in, in and for his time. Speaking of the time, Gettysburg was not seen as a particularly significant battle in the course of the war. It's only since uh, we have the full the context and back of the American Civil War that we see Gettysburg as a significant battle, just in terms of, of blood and violence. Uh, not to mention the important speech that Abraham Lincoln gave Gettysburg address managed to score a massive victory 
and won, they desperately needed. And if that wasn't enough, in the west, after a month-long siege, Vicksburg finally fell. The north now held the Mississippi. And better yet, it was the 4th of July. With control of the Mississippi, Union forces moved into Arkansas and Tennessee. Tennessee in particular saw heavy fighting, with Union General Rosecrans masterfully pushing Braxton Bragg's Army of the Tennessee out of Tennessee. He suffered a major setback, however, at the Bloody Battle of Chickamauga and ended up under a Confederate siege at Chattanooga. At one point during the siege, a temporary truce was declared so that wounded men could be recovered. And often in the Civil War, during these small truces, men from both sides would meet in the middle to trade things like tobacco, coffee, and maybe even Vicksburg, 4th of July, and the Siege of Chattanooga. Thankfully, General Grant, now in charge of all Western Union armies, showed up and karate kicked Bragg right back into Georgia. Like this. With Sherman and Hooker, Grant took on Confederate positions in the mountains around the city, including the famous battle above the clouds and Mission Ridge. Grant continued to be Lincoln's number one guy. With these victories, Lincoln hoped the war was finally turning. Back in Gettysburg, the entire town had been turned into a hospital to care for the scores of wounded men. Throughout the war, on both sides, women such as Clara Barton rose to the occasion, doing crucial work on the home front and volunteering as nurses for those who had given their lives. A new national cemetery was to be a... So Clara Barton um, became head nurse of the Union armies. Um, she was known as the angel of the battlefield. Uh, she was also uh, an important figure in identifying Union soldiers' graves at the Confederate prisoner of war camp of, of Andersonville, which was a terrible place to be. And she was also the person who founded the American Red Cross. So important part of American history here. Established at Gettysburg, and Abraham Lincoln traveled out to attend the opening ceremony. At the event, the main speaker spoke for two hours. Then Abraham Lincoln was called forward to give some brief, appropriate remarks. In just two minutes, he masterfully and poignantly iterated America's national purpose and the need to continue the fight. The Gettysburg Address would become one of the most famous speeches in American history. While they were now making progress... And even the headline speaker, the keynote speaker who spoke for two hours, acknowledged uh, the, the skill of Abraham Lincoln in his speech, saying he got to the point quicker and better than, than he was able to. So... It, the guy wasn't upset, as is sometimes said, um, but he acknowledged Lincoln's skill and the importance of that speech. The North still couldn't find a decisive victory in the East, and that was bad news for Lincoln because his presidency was now in its fourth year. In 1864, there was an election coming. The Confederates knew this too, and with little hope left of being able to threaten the North militarily, they believed their last shot at victory may be in the election <laughs> since Lincoln... BTS? Maybe I guess I, I think it's BTS. I don't really know K-pop. Yes, it's BTS. That's that's cool. In the election, since Lincoln, emancipation, and the war itself weren't exactly popular. People in the North were sick of war and wanted to put it behind them. Robert E. Lee hoped that if he could just hold out and continue to inflict more defeats, the people of the North would vote Lincoln out and replace him with a Southern sympathizer who may be willing to negotiate. Lincoln knew now he desperately needed a victory. Now I know what you're thinking. But oversimplified. If Lincoln loves General Grant so much, then why doesn't he put him in charge of the campaign in the East? Well, guess what, loyal subscriber? You've hit the nail on the head. You're bold, Grant. I'll grant you that. I'm promoting you to General in Chief, and I ain't taking you for granted. Now I want you to go defeat Lee. Grant me my wish. Please stop. So Grant was put in charge, and he came up with a new plan. He wanted to press. So Grant, General in Chief, now. General Meade is still uh, head of the Army of the Potomac, but now Grant is placed over him. He's given um, like Lieutenant General, which was uh, uh, something that, that uh, George Washington did. So this is a special position for Grant. If I remember correctly, Grant was not interested in moving his command from the West to the East. He preferred to stay in the West, but popular public sentiment demanded essentially that he be in the East. And again, this goes back to the fact that people focused on the East theater, focused on the war in Virginia. So that's why Grant ended up being um, general in chief in the East and participating uh, throughout the war in the East.
Press the Confederates on all fronts, with General Banks to capture Mobile, Alabama, General Sherman moving south to Atlanta, and Grant joining the Army of the Potomac as they advanced through Virginia. In May 1864, that plan went into action. Sherman steadily advanced on Atlanta, facing off against the smaller Confederate army under General Joseph E. Johnston. In addition, a cruel yet highly skilled cavalry general and winner of the funniest Confederate statue award, Nathan Bedford Forrest, was also nearby doing his best to threaten Sherman's advance. But in a series of battles, Sherman dominated and pushed Johnson back to the city. But he was held just outside of Atlanta itself and was forced to lay siege. Meanwhile, the main show was happening to the east in Virginia. The Union's top general was finally about to face off. So how Sherman made it to Atlanta is essentially he followed the railroad tracks from Chattanooga, Tennessee, down to Atlanta. And he made a lot of great progress. And there was a lot of frustrations um, on the Confederate side as to Johnson's ability to stop this advance. Against the Confederacies, Lincoln hoped Grant would bring something new to the Eastern Theater and bring something new. He did. As Grant began moving south, Lee still regularly outmaneuvered him and inflicted heavy casualties, hoping to demoralize the North as much as he could. But here's what set Grant apart from others. He knew Lee was running out of men and that the North by comparison had plenty. Grant would throw his forces at Lee and even when Lee repelled them, Grant, rather than pulling back, would give the order to keep moving forward and flank Lee again and again. In under six weeks, 80,000 men would be killed, wounded, or missing. In DC, Grant was and this was part of, because he's general in chief of the armies, this is a plan that he's having put into action across all theaters of war. The way we're going to win this in his mind is we're going to continue to fight him. Um, to, you know, to quote the line from that movie, we're going we're gonna to hold on to him by the nose and we're going to kick him in the ass. And we're going to kick the hell out of him all the time. And we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. Pardon my French. But it's a great line. And And so this is what... Grant is doing. He's constantly uh, engaging the Confederates in battle, pursuing a war of, of attrition and on the Confederate armies. And so he's doing this in the Eastern Theater, he's having Sherman do this in the Western Theater. He was criticized for being a butcher. At the Battle of the Wilderness, the Union casualties were so heavy that Grant reportedly began to weep. But still, Grant could replace his losses. Lee couldn't. And he was being pushed all the way back to Richmond. Lee knew once he got there, he'd be under siege. Then it would only be a matter of time. Close to Richmond, Grant again suffered horrific casualties in a miscalculated assault at Cold Harbor. Then, trying to be a tricksty trickster, instead of moving on Richmond directly, Grant moved towards Petersburg to flank the Confederate capital and cut its supply line. But just like Sherman, Grant was halted outside of the city and he too was forced to settle in for a siege. Two identical sieges would not be good enough for Lincoln's re-election. The people of the North saw the casualties Grant had been taking, and they weren't happy. To make matters worse, Lee had sent Jubal Early north to threaten D.C. with the hope of forcing Grant to withdraw troops from Richmond. Early was repelled on the outskirts of the city, with President Lincoln even attending as an observer, but the North had been given a fright. So with the war currently in a stalemate, who was to be Lincoln's opponent in the critical 1864 election? Who would the Democrats choose? Guess what, baby? <laughs> I'm back. That's right. General George B. McClellan would run for president against Abraham Lincoln. My fellow countrymen, if you elect me, I, the great General George McClellan, will fearlessly and valiantly win the war. Unlike this douchebag, many Democrats, however, including McClellan's running mate, wanted to end the war. So it's possible McClellan may have ended up fearlessly and valiantly making peace with the Confederates, which is exactly what they were hoping for. With the war in a stalemate and Lincoln... So the Republicans in the 1864 election, they didn't necessarily tout them as a Republican party. They said we're the Union party. Um, because the Union was more, was more palatable to voters, at least so they thought. <clears throat> McClellan, on the other hand, was was a Democrat, and so uh, the Republican Party or the Union Party, as they were calling themselves, said, "We're going to pursue a successful end of the war, and we're going to reunite the Union without slavery." The Democrats, on the other hand, who knows what they're going to do? Who knows if McClellan will uh, negotiate a peace, um, or if he will fight the war, win the war, bring the Union back together? but not abolish slavery, allow the states to come back um, with slaves and really not solve the problem. 
So they painted McClellan as a really unknown. We don't know what he's going to do. How can we trust that? It's better to stick with what you know, go with Lincoln. And still not popular, it looked like McClellan would win, and the Confederacy may have a chance at surviving, after all. Lincoln himself said that without some kind of major victory, it seemed exceedingly probable that this administration will not be re-elected. Well, fret not, Abe, because if it's a major victory you want, it's a major victory, after all. Lincoln himself said that without some kind of major victory, it seemed exceedingly probable that this administration will not be re-elected. Well, fret not, Abe, because if it's a major victory you want, it's a major victory you'll get. Atlanta had been under siege by General Sherman for just over a month. After a number of battles around the city, Sherman sent a force south to sever the city's supply line, and Confederate General Hood was forced to abandon it. Atlanta, one of the Confederacy's most important cities, had fallen into Union hands. For many, it was clear that the Confederate Now, Atlanta was a huge, it was a psychologically important city. Yes, it had railroads and things in and out of it, but it was a psychological victory uh, for the North, a psychological defeat for the South. Confederacy's defeat was now inevitable, and the war would soon be over. When the final results came in, Lincoln had won with an electoral college landslide, with the troops in particular voting overwhelmingly for Lincoln which must have been touching for their commander-in-chief. Hey man, looks like you lost. No hard feelings? I didn't lose. I merely failed to win. In January, Lincoln involved himself heavily in ensuring the 13th Amendment made it through Congress. In a narrow and historic vote, the amendment passed. Slavery would now be constitutionally banished throughout the nation. Black men and women watching the vote from the galleries knew the work had only just begun. A couple months later, at his second inauguration, with victory right around the corner, he didn't celebrate, he didn't gloat. Instead, he emphasized the need for reunification and binding up wounds. To him, Americans, North or South, were to again be compatriots. However, listen- Now, if you want a good look, and chances are if you like Civil War history, you've seen the movie, but the movie Lincoln, uh, that movie really uh, centers on the 13th Amendment. <clears throat> now, um, the Thirteenth Amendment was also made uh, mandatorily acceptable. So, uh, after the war, if a state wanted to be readmitted to the, they had to accept the Thirteenth. Um, if they didn't, they would remain a federal territory. And there's disadvantages to being a federal territory. You don't have home rule or self rule exactly. You're governed by Washington D.C. And so, it was better for people to states territories to become states utah for example they pressed time and time and time again from the 1850s onward to be state uh but mormons and polygamy uh, just really weren't palatable to washington they failed until 1886 um but being a state was a big thing it was politically advantageous to be a state in the union as opposed to a territory of the Listening to Lincoln speak that day was a man who had no interest in reunification. John Wilkes Booth, an actor living in D.C., was also a deep Southern sympathizer. And as the war turned against the Confederacy, depressed and full of hate, he was already plotting his revenge on the man he held responsible. With further Confederate losses, it was... Now, Booth came from a well-known, well-respected acting family. So if, you know, take your pick of whatever... Um, well-known family in Hollywood. Imagine a member of their family trying to assassinate the president of the United States, and that's really what you have here in the case of John Wilkes Booth. Uh, I guess I'll let it play out, see if they talk more about Lincoln's assassination. Pretty clear at this point who would win, but still, Jefferson Davis showed no sign of giving in. The North were frustrated to see the conflict being dragged out. Why waste more lives? In Atlanta, General Sherman believed he had the key to forcing the Confederacy's hand. He had an unusually modern concept that an army could only survive with the support of the people. Strike at the people and the army collapses. Sherman decided to do something unprecedented. He would remove his 62,000 men from their supply line and march through the heartland of the Confederacy where they would live off the land. There, they would wreak havoc. As they marched, they tore up railroads, burned farms, and destroyed communication lines. They also liberated thousands of slaves. The damage done was estimated at $1.4 billion. The tactics were cruel, but to Sherman, it was better than losing yet more men in battle. In December, he reached some- A lot of people place this idea on Sherman, and it really 
is really Grant's um, Grant's idea. This is part of Grant's plan to uh, demoralize the South, to weaken the South through attrition. And so instead of, of just relying on supply trains, you can now demoralize the population by, by taking their fat of the land um, and, and just destroying it, taking their crops. And of course, this was kind of thing was all, already going on. If you were a farmer in um, the Shenandoah Valley and you had wooden fence posts, it didn't matter if you were a Confederate sympathizer or a Union sympathizer, your fence posts were gone. The armies took the fence posts and used it for their own purposes, whether it be firewood or building ca cabins or huts or whatever. Uh, your personal property was subject to seizure by by armies. Savannah, Georgia, but he wasn't done yet. Next, he turned north to inflict his punishment on the first state to secede, South Carolina. As he moved, he came ever closer to General Lee's army, still holding out at Petersburg. The siege of Petersburg had lasted for 292 days. 60,000 of Lee's men had deserted. Numerous Union attempts to break through had failed, but when the breakthrough finally... Oh, there we go. We had the Battle of the Crater mentioned. Now, this is where we're seeing trench warfare, uh, of the kind that you would see in World War I. Uh, both sides are entrenched. Uh, there's not a lot of movement. And in order to break this stalemate, the Union sends uh, soldiers who have experience in mining coal miners to dig a tunnel under the Confederate lines where they stuff it with 8,000 tons of black powder, which they detonate and blow a hole in the Confederate lines 400 yards wide, four football fields. The problem, however, is that that hole is not effectively exploited. This is where we see black soldiers sent in um, to engage in combat. Like I said before, they were poorly led, and so they were never really able to effectively secure that point uh, to make the hole fully exploitable. These men fought bravely, and in some cases where they attempted or they were simply shot down by uh, Confederate soldiers for being black men. So uh, we're seeing the, kind of the birth of, of more modern warfare, what we'd see. It finally came. It came quick. On April 2nd, a Union assault finally pushed the Confederates from their defenses. Hey, man, there's no need to evacuate, right? You'll rescue us like last time, right? Sorry, can't hear you. Portia. Lee narrowly, right? Sorry, can't hear you. Lee narrowly escaped the city, hoping he'd be able to meet up with General Johnson and continue the fight. Grant chased him down. Richmond was evacuated, and Jefferson Davis went on the run. As they left, the Confederates set fire to military buildings, but the flames burned out of control, and as the Union troops arrived, they became firefighters. A couple of days later, Abraham Lincoln visited the war-torn city. Grant caught up to Lee at Appomattox Courthouse, where he trapped his forces. It was here, on April 9th, 1865, that Lee saw no point in continuing. Uh, sir? Listen, bub, I drank a bit too much last night, and now I'm hanging like a fruit bat on a hot day. So whatever you have to say, I don't want to hear it. Uh, General Lee says he wants to surrender. Hot diggity dog! Grant and Lee met in the home of a nearby farm family, owned by a man who had tried his best to escape the Civil War years earlier, Wilmer McLean. All right, can we all just hurry up and get this over with? Martha, not now. I'm cleaning. Do you want us to get rats? Grant and Lee, after years of war, now spoke respectfully to one another. When Lee left, his face filled with emotion, Grant's men began to cheer, but Grant ordered them to stop. He knew that now was the time for reconciliation. Just over two weeks later, General Johnson would surrender to Sherman, now, Lee, before surrendering his army, he had ideas that uh, rather than surrender, he would engage in a guerrilla warfare uh, to carry the war on. But eventually, he, uh, he opted to surrender. Now, the surrender happened on, on April 9th. Um, Confederates gave up their arms officially by stacking them at the Appomattox Courthouse on April 12th, and they were dissolved. Grant gave these Confederate soldiers very generous terms. Uh, he said, if you sign a parole, you can return to your homes in peace. If you have a horse, you can keep your horse. Um, if you sign the parole, we'll also give you rations from the Union Army, but we're not going to feed your horses, just you. And so that was 
a, a very generous offer from from Grant, and it was taken up. The defeat of the Army of Virginia was really seen by many as the effective end or as again so much attention north and the south was placed on that army fighting in the ending the war for 89,000 confederate soldiers in the largest surrender of the war not every confederate state had surrendered but the war was as good as over across the north church bells rang out and celebrations erupted in washington lincoln gave a speech from the white house to a jubilant crowd in which, among various things, he expressed his support for black voting rights. Lincoln had seen the nation through its deepest crisis. The presidency had visibly aged him. He had lost over 20 pounds. He said sometimes, I think I am the tiredest man on earth. I'm not sure tiredest is a word, but geez, the man's exhausted. Cut him some... But uh, the presidency always takes an enormous toll on the person inhabiting it. Um, I, more recently, if you look at President Obama, Look at uh, when he went into office in 2008 and left office in 2016, it's visibly aged in a significant way, and Lincoln certainly so. Slack. On a carriage ride with Mary, Lincoln clearly was looking forward to being a president in a time of peace. He was apparently very cheerful, surprising his wife, and he told her that between the war and the loss of their son, they'd both been very miserable. Now, it was time to be happy. On the evening of April 14th, Lincoln attended a play with his wife and some friends at Ford's Theater. It was a comedy, and the president appeared to be enjoying it very much. In a nearby bar, John Wilkes Booth swallowed two glasses of brandy. He slipped quietly into the president's booth and awaited for the audience's laughter to rise. The president was shot in the back of the head. Booth fled the city. Soldiers carried Lincoln to a boarding house across the street. There, doctors declared there was nothing they could do. So before we progress too much further with Lincoln's death, John Wilkes Booth um, initially planned to, to kidnap Lincoln, and he changed that plan, assassinating him as he did. This was part of a broader plot that was meant to take out uh, William Seward, Secretary of State and Vice President. Andrew Johnson. Uh, William Seward was wounded in an attempt on his life, and Johnson didn't have any trouble at all, really. Uh, Booth was hunted down, and he was killed uh, in a barn later on. This sparked immediate uh, conspiracy thinking in the North, uh, not unreasonably because people thought that this was a Confederate plot to assassinate Lincoln, as uh, Lee had only just surrendered less than a week before, so these themes, these things seem to be deeply connected. Um, and there's also been conspiracy theories that have have gone on in the years since. Uh, I think one of the more popular ones that you'll find if you look is that there were leaders in the North who wanted to eliminate Lincoln because he was going to be on the South, and really, there's no good quality evidence to support that. But a lot of people have made a lot of money advancing that conspiracy theory. Surrounded by his heartbroken wife, son, and members of cabinet, at 722 the next morning, President Lincoln passed away. Never before had a president been murdered. A shocked nation mourned as a 12-day funeral procession carried Lincoln back to his home in Springfield, Illinois. On April 26th, Union Cavalry found John Wilkes Booth in a barn in Virginia where he was shot. Not long after, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was also tracked down and arrested. Imprisoned for two years, he was eventually released. The North didn't want to put him on trial for fear the jury may rule that Southern secession had in fact been legal. To ensure reconciliation, other Confederate generals and politicians were allowed to re-enter life in the now restored Union. Scattered fighting continued into May when the last Confederate forces in Texas disintegrated. The southern states came under northern military occupation to prevent any further rebellion, and a very difficult era of reconstruction began. Over three million Americans had fought brother against brother. The Civil War remains the bloodiest conflict in U.S. history, but the Union had been preserved. You could say the real winners were those who were to never again be slaves. Further amendments passed by Congress gave black individuals the right to citizenship and to vote. 
significant progress had been made. However, entering into the 20th century, it was clear the fight for equality would continue. In modern America, the man who fought to preserve the nation and never gave up in the darkest of times stands as a symbol of honesty, empathy, humility, perseverance, and courage. A continuous reminder of what has forged America and what it should ever strive to be. Thumbs. Oh, I love the music there. That was a terrific ending. <clears throat> Never would I have thought ever that uh, uh, an oversimplified video would give me. <clears throat> that was really good. So, yeah, uh, you know, historians, uh, some historians these days say that underlying problems that led to the Civil War and were fought over during the Civil War have never really been resolved. Civil rights still an issue. And yes, it is, but to a, a much lesser degree. I think we have to acknowledge the significant progress that was achieved during the course of the Civil War and as a result of the Civil War, but also uh, achievements that were gained during, well, 100 years later um, during the Civil Rights Movement. So we live in very different times from. 50s and the 1950s. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that while still acknowledging that there, there's still work to be done. So terrific video. I, I, I really liked it. Um, thank you for joining me. I hope you found some of my comments a little uh, insightful. And if you stuck with me this long, we're cranking it nearly an hour. I really appreciate it again. And I hope to see you in the next video.